Uh, good evening to you all. Uh, a hearty welcome to the next session of the pain palliative uh, course. Uh, so, uh, without uh, uh, further delays, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, he's Dr. Sunil Kumar. He's the additional director of TIPS uh, Organ of Pallium India. He has a diploma in palliative medicine in, both in India and in Cardiff, UK, and a master's in palliative medicine from Cardiff. He has 15 years of experience in palliative medicine. Uh, clinical services, uh, academics, and research of Palium India are also overseen by Dr. Sunil Kumar. So we are very fortunate to have such a, uh, an eminent faculty with us for the presentation today. Uh, since uh, now it's uh, time to start, I'll uh, hand over the session to you, sir, for the uh, rest of the duration. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Arshu, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, am I audible, Dr. Arshu? Yes, sir, you are. Perfectly. Okay. Uh, so uh, today uh, we are going to first part of opioids, uh, and I would request all of you to make this an interactive session. Um, so uh, let me start sharing my screen. Okay, uh, so uh, today and uh, the next week, we'll be talking about uh, what are the commonly used opioids and which are relevant to India. Uh, there are a lot of opioids available uh, in the world, but uh, we have uh, only a few. Uh, so we will talk about that. Then uh, uh, when we use opioids, uh, our problem is that uh, we will come across many uh, blocks uh, what shall we do now, uh, in such a situation? And uh, there are many doubts. So we will talk about some practical issues of opioids use. And uh, uh, very importantly, all of you know uh, the uh, adverse effects of opioids, but we will uh, review those uh, adverse effects. Uh, so this is the plan. And today uh, we will uh, cover um, the first part of opioids. So you have seen this uh, WHO ladder and you have covered uh, the first step of ladder uh, and all, yeah, uh, first step of ladder you have completed. So let's uh, recollect uh, some of the things uh, which uh, we have learned uh, in the last uh, two classes. So in the first step, as you know, there are non-opioid plus or minus surgery. So non-opioids include paracetamol and NSAIDs. So paracetamol is a, a safer medication which uh, we can use uh, in many of the patients. And we know that uh, NSAIDs sometimes may be very difficult to use because of many contraindications. So uh, maximum dose of paracetamol is 4 grams per day. And if you look at the uh, uh, dosage uh, as per body weight, it is 12 to 15 milligram per kilogram body weight, not exceeding the 4 grams per day. And uh, adjuvants, uh, which uh, we uh, commonly use to treat pain, uh, are those medications whose primary indication is not pain relief, but it is helpful in some painful condition. Those medications are known as adjuvant analgesics. So there are many adjuvant analgesics. Uh, you know that uh, uh, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, anticonvulsants, uh, corticosteroids, uh, uh, muscle relaxants, all those are uh, adjunct analgesics. So if you take uh, tricyclic antidepressants, the primary action is to treat depression, but it is helpful in some painful condition like neuropathy. Pain. So that's why it becomes an adjunct analgesic. Uh, and uh, uh, in the second step, uh, we have uh, opioids for mild to moderate pain. So we'll start from there. Okay. So I request all of you to go through this uh, patient's uh, history. So this is a 35-year-old man, uh, father of two young kids. I think uh, you already had a discussion uh, of this patient. So 35-year-old man. Uh, father of two young kids has been diagnosed with carcinoma of the upper lobe of right lung and has 
deep seated gnawing pain over right suprascapular and infraclavicular area he is unable to sleep at night so uh, this patient is on uh, paracetamol 750 mg 6 hourly tab ibuprofen 400 mg tid after food and tab pantoprazol 40 mg od but he says uh, his uh, pain relief is not adequate <clears throat> So, how will you manage this patient? Uh, can anybody unmute and speak? So, these are the types of patients that we that we are going to see in our clinical practice. You will start to opioid analgesics. six. Okay. Uh, what of your analgesics? How do you like to start? Like, start with tramadol. Okay. Or or ultraset. Hmm. Uh, TDS. That is. Um, okay. Fifty milligram TDS and see if the pain relief is complete or no. And uh, okay. probably along with that we can add some antidepressants or something to see whether it is taking care of the sleep and anxiety and whatever problems he is facing. That will be the first, okay. uh, the the second step. That is okay. Uh, so uh, suppose uh, uh, suppose this patient has uh, mild uh, or moderate pain. So uh, I couldn't see who answered that question. Um, so so uh, we can add uh, any of this, isn't it? There are uh, many opioids uh, to treat mild to moderate pain. So with paracetamol and NSAIDs, patient had unsatisfactory pain. So we will move on to the next step. So the next step is opioids for mild to moderate pain. So these are the opioids available in India in the second step. That is opioids for mild to moderate pain. Tramadol, tapenadol, codeine, and dextropropoxy. So, uh, tramadol, uh, what is the mechanism of action of uh, tramadol? So, you, uh, we know that uh, opioids acts on opioid receptors, and there are mainly three opioid receptors, mu, kappa, and delta. So, tramadol acts on mu receptor as an agonist opioid. But in addition to that, uh, it has also another mechanism of action. It inhibits the reuptake of noradrenaline and serotonin, which is like a tricyclic antidepressant. So this uh, makes uh, tramadol a little different from other opioids, most of the other opioids. Uh, so uh, we know that tricyclic antidepressants are used to treat neuropathic pain. Uh, so theoretically, if you look at tramadol, it should help in treating neuropathic pain. But practically, uh, it doesn't have uh, much action on neuropathic pain, or it is as like as other opioids. So, uh, uh, anybody uh, can uh, tell us uh, what is uh, when you compare drugs, we use the term potency. So, what is the potency means? Anybody? Okay, potency means it is the weight by weight ratio. Suppose a patient has pain relief with, uh, suppose it is uh, tramadol. Uh, so when you convert the tramadol to morphine, uh, is there anything you can do? Is there any equivalent doses you can convert from tramadol to morphine. So that is the weight by ratio, weight by weight ratio. So 50 milligram of tramadol is equal to how many milligram of morphine? So that's mean, and that's what potency means. So uh, if you look at the potency of tramadol, it is one by 10 plus potent as morphine. That means 10 milligram of tramadol is equal to one milligram of morphine. So in your clinical practice, if you want to convert a patient uh, suppose a patient is taking 200 milligram of tramadol and he doesn't have uh, pain relief and you want to convert this patient to <clears throat> morphine. 
So how do you convert? Patient is taking total 200 milligram of tramadol. So you can divide it by 10. That means the patient at present is taking uh, an equivalent of 20 milligram of morphine. So you can act, you actually need to give more uh, morphine. Uh, instead of 20, you may go on to uh, 30 or 45, something like that. So it is important to know the potency. So tramadol is 1 by 10 plus potent as morphine. And another important thing about tramadol is it lowers the seizure threshold. I don't know how many of you have seen this problem with uh, tramadol, but uh, if you look at the literature, uh, it has been very uh, well documented. Uh, but uh, during the last uh, 17 years of my experience with tramadol, I haven't seen any, but uh, uh, this can be a problem. Uh, tramadol can reduce the seizure threshold, especially in patients with um, problems like, uh, or uh, problems uh, which can reduce the seizure threshold. For example, a patient with brain metastasis, which we uh, usually see, or patients who are taking other medications, which can reduce seizure threshold, like uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, antipsychotics, uh, all those medications. Most importantly, uh, when uh, you administer tramadol, it should not be administered very rapidly through IV route. And uh, it is said that if you give uh, tramadol uh, very fast through an IV route, it can produce seizure. So these are uh, some important points that we have to keep in mind about tramadol. And uh, this is another problem which you might have noted. Patients uh, might complain of uh, nausea and vomiting after giving tramadol. And uh, uh, duration of action is four to nine hours. So uh, you may give it uh, uh, TID or uh, even four hours. But uh, the maximum dose recommended is 400 milligrams. So after 400 milligram, the chance of nausea and vomiting is even more. So, uh, and another problem is, uh, you know that uh, tramadol is costly compared to uh, other uh, analysis. Okay, uh, so uh, for our patient, uh, now the prescription is tap paracetamol, 750 milligram, six hourly. Tap tramadol, 50 milligram, eight hourly. Uh, then fibrogel powder, two teaspoon in one glass of water. <clears throat> so, uh, do you want to make uh, any changes in this prescription? Anybody? Or is there a problem with this prescription? Would like to add an antiemetic and an antacid, preferably. Uh, okay, uh, antiemetic and an antacid. Okay, thank you, Dr. Priya. Uh, anything else you want to modify? Uh, so, do you see the paracetamol can be reduced? No? To 650, yes. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, uh, that is, uh, 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 you look at the weight and then if needed, you can reduce, but otherwise uh, this dose is um, safe uh, because One, uh, four gram what? per day, up to four gram per day is safe. We have to add one uh, proton pump inhibitor. Okay, uh, so uh, let me tell you uh, one thing. Uh, opioids doesn't cause uh, gastritis like NSAIDs. So um, uh, proton pump inhibitors or antacids are not actually indicated while you prescribe opioids. But uh, as Dr. Priya told, uh, an antiemetic uh, should be given uh, if you prescribe okay. opioids for the first time. So what, what is the antiemetic that is uh, often uh, prescribed? Or, yeah. 
biggest of us choice of antiemetics in opioid induced vomiting hello peridol yeah uh, actually um the d2 receptor and perinum yeah uh. D2 receptor antagonists, that's dopaminergic type 2 receptor antagonists are the preferred medications to treat opioid induced nausea and vomiting. So, mm -hmm. haliperidol is the strongest D2 blocker, followed by metoclopramide and dometron. So, we mm -hmm. usually give metoclopramide uh, because of uh, many advantages. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we can add antiemetic. What about fibrogen powder? Anybody want to comment on that? Anybody? It's not needed, no, for tramadol does not cause much constipation or anything. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, what I need to say is. Um, Actually, uh, opioids produces constipation uh, in almost all patients. And uh, literature says it's about 95% of patients have constipation with opioids. So we have to give uh, an uh, laxity, uh, but uh, should it be fibrogel? That means methyl cellulose or espargola husk, uh, something like that. No, it should be only uh, agents like Dalcolex. Yeah, uh, uh, so uh, the opioids produces constipation by uh, many mechanisms. And one of the mechanism is that it reduces the um, uh, forward peristalsis. And uh, uh, so uh, we have to give a laxative, uh, which will also increase the peristalsis. So uh, it is stimulant laxative is the drug of choice for opioid induced constipation. So sodium picosulfate, and bisacodyl, senna. These are the three um, stimulant laxatives available for us. So we usually use bisacodyl, but uh, any of this uh, should do. So instead of uh, fibrogen powder, uh, actually uh, we should uh, uh, remove it because uh, you know that when Ispagola has for methyl cellulose, uh, we ask the patient to mix it with water and uh, then immediately uh, swallow. But uh, if uh, you allow uh, this uh, powder uh, to be in the glass for some time without swallowing, what will happen? It will become a very hard substance. Uh, so uh, especially in our patients who is not taking much uh, fibrogel powder, uh, when it goes into the um, bowel, it can actually uh, become very hard if you don't take a lot of water. So uh, it is actually uh, contraindicated or should not be used spagola has for methyl cellulose in patients who are taking opioids. Instead, we should use stimulant laxatives like this according. So this is uh, the correct one. Tap paracetamol, 750 milligram, six hourly. Tramadol, 50 milligram, eight hourly. Metoclopramide, 10 milligram, uh, thrice a day, into three days. Uh, uh, one of the important thing is that the opioid induced uh, nausea and vomiting. Uh, it occurs only for the first few days, maybe three to five days. After that, uh, the body will get adjusted to that. <coughs> So we need not uh, continue with uh, antiemetic. So that's why it is prescribed for three days. And it is according, as I told, it's a stimulant acid. And we can ask the patient uh, to come for a review after three days. So uh, I'm moving on to another patient. So this is a patient, a 70 year old man with carcinoma of the lung and is complaining of throbbing pain on right front of chest, which is continuous in nature and his course five by 10. So that's a moderate pain. Um, up to three, you can call it as mild pain. Uh, four to six, it is moderate pain. Uh, seven and above, it is severe pain. So he's also a non-epileptic and is on phenytoin 100 milligram BD. How will you manage his pain? Anybody? Oh, 
I would move on to the third step that is morphine, since pain is uh, moderate. Uh, okay. Um, so the first step of WHO analgesic ladder is to treat mild pain, and second step yes, is sir. for treating moderate pain. Moderate and pain. And third step is for treating severe pain. Severe pain. So, uh, so what would be the app, uh, or which step would uh, we have to use here? For this patient with moderate pain, it is the second step, isn't it? So, how are you going to manage this pain? Anybody? So we know that uh, in the second step, we have a tramadol, a tapenadol, codeine, and dextrofloxacin. But we told that uh, tramadol uh, can reduce the seizure threshold and it can precipitate seizure in patients. Uh, this patient is already a non-epileptic. So it is uh, wise not to start uh, tramadol in this patient or trapenadol uh, because uh, both act by the same mechanism. Uh, and uh, codeine is uh, usually not used now. And dextrofloxacin is uh, another option. Uh, but uh, if dextrofloxacin is not available, what should be used? So you can use, actually, uh, maybe as Dr. Priya told, uh, we can uh, use uh, the third step, that is morphine. So a low dose of morphine can be used in this patient. Because uh, this patient uh, can have seizure. That's why we are moving on to step three. Otherwise, we should have used uh, tramadol in this patient. So in the second step, we have codeine, um, tramadol, uh, tapenadol, and dextrofloxacin. So we talked about tramadol, and tapenadol also works by the same mechanism. And codeine is another drug uh, which uh, was used previously, but now its use is very much reduced. And uh, the potency is also one by 10 as potent as morphine. What is the most uh, common problem that you have seen with codeine? Because uh, you might have prescribed uh, codeine for many patients. Constipation. Yeah, constipation is one of the common problem that you have with codeine. And uh, codeine, uh, it uh, it um, actually gets metabolized in the liver into codeine 6 glucuronide and later it gets converted to morphine and it's metabolized. So actually, uh, codeine is a uh, pro drug of morphine. But uh, you can see it is weaker than morphine. And uh, the uh, metab uh, metabolism uh, actually depends on uh, cytochrome P enzyme 2D6. And uh, uh, this enzyme can have genetic uh, polymorphism among the population. So if you give uh, codeine uh, to a lot of people in a population, some people may not have pain relief because uh, they are poor metabolizers <coughs> because of the uh, genetic polymorphism of cytochrome P2D6 enzyme. Uh, so um, this is uh, not used uh, commonly now. <clears throat> and uh, onset of action is 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, and it's uh, also act for four to six hours. And maximum recommended dose is 360 milligram. But you know that uh, when we uh, prescribe uh, codeine, even uh, 30 milligram BD, uh, that itself is uh, very constipating. And uh, because of the uh, problem with the uh, uh, metabolism, uh, it is not usually used now and it is costly also. So what are the uses of codeine? You can use it for pain relief. You can use, uh, it can be a cough suppressant and it can be also an anti diarrhea So if uh, we rule out any uh, correctable causes of diarrhea and uh, uh, then uh, we can prescribe uh, codeine as an anti diarrhea 
So moving on to desktop proxy, which is the other uh, weak opioid or opioids for mild to moderate. Actually, this uh, desktop proxy, the use was suspended for some time, but now it has come back uh, into the market with a um, indication to use it uh, only for cancer pain. And uh, I don't know, uh, any of you are using desktop proxy? Anybody? No. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is available in market now. Uh, and uh, uh, the most uh, important things about dextropropoxifene is that its main metabolite is norpropoxifene and it accumulates in renal failure. So uh, it, is, uh, it should not be used in patients with renal failure. And if you compare the potency, it is 1 by 12. Uh, codeine and tramadol is 1 by 10 plus potent as morphine, whereas dexopropoxifene is 1 by 12 plus potent as morphine. And even uh, more, uh, dexopropoxifene will take three to four days to get the blood level stabilized. So we have to wait for three to four days to get the proper pain relief. And it takes for six to eight hours. So you can see this is the order from the joint secretary. Uh, this should only be used for cancer pain and the daily administered dose should not exceed 300 milligram per day. So this is the uh, new order uh, came from center government about next to the And it is available as available in two, uh, two forms. One is uh, dextropropoxifene alone. That is a 65 milligram capsules and the other with in combination with uh, paracetamol. 65 milligram dextropropoxifene plus 325 milligram of paracetamol. Uh, so, uh, this, uh, the, our patient uh, whom we have seen at first, uh, he's on tramadol 50 milligram, six hourly now, but his pain suddenly increased for the past two days. And now he says, my pain score is 10 by 10. I am unable to bear this pain. Please do something. How do you manage his pain now? Previously, he had a pain score of 5 by 10 or moderate pain. Now it's 10 by 10. So how are you going to manage? Anybody? It's morphine only. Okay. Uh, so, and because this patient has severe pain, we can move on to the uh, step three of the WHO analgesic ladder. So, the step three is uh, morphine and other strong opioids. So, morphine is the usually available one, so you can use morphine. So, what formulation of morphine will you use in this patient? Immediate release? Yeah, immediate release tablet. Oral tablet, yeah. Okay. If we uh, have injection, we can uh, titrate immediately uh, to reduce the yeah. pain. Yeah. yeah, and after that, we can convert to tablet. Okay, thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. So, uh, when a patient comes to us with severe pain, we should uh, give pain relief as fast as possible. So mm -hmm. as Madam told, uh, we have to give uh, injection if it is available with you. So how will you give injection morphine to a patient? Anybody? What should be the dose? We should first calculate the dose of oral morphine and then uh, I think divide by half will be the intravenous morphine dose. Based on the tramadol, okay, we calculate yes. the morphine. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Suppose uh, this patient came for the first time to us. This patient is not on any opioid and he is coming with 10 by 10 pain. So how should we do the intravenous morphine trial or titration? Okay. 
okay uh, so uh, intravenous morphine titration is done with uh, injection morphine 1.5 mg intravenously at every 10 minutes so do you expect any immediate side effect by giving uh, injection morphine Respiratory depression, drowsiness, and then respiratory depression, drowsiness. Okay, uh, so the most important or most common thing which can occur immediately after giving injection morphine would be nausea and vomiting. So you have to uh, give injection metoclopramide 10 mg IV before starting intravenous morphine trial. And after that, you will give 1.5 mg at 10 minutes interval. And uh, how long would you continue to give uh, injectable morphine? Or what is the end point of morphine titration? So end point is either satisfactory pain relief. Uh, to the, the patient, patient has pain relief. Yeah. So the end point is either satisfactory pain relief or sleepiness, whichever yes. be the first. Okay. Mm. So. Uh, morphine may not give complete pain relief for all patients. So some patients uh, may have uh, get some pain relief, but they become drowsy. That means we have to stop the trial then. Uh, if you continue to give um, injectable morphine to that patient, uh, then probably after some doses, a respiratory depression and things can uh, be complicated. But if you look at this endpoint, Usually, uh, there will not be any respiratory depression. So this is the importance of intravenous morphine titration. Um, the patients, uh, we can safely administer intravenous morphine in our patient setting. So uh, this is the intravenous morphine uh, titration chart, which we usually use. The nurses records uh, all this. Uh, the time at which you have given morphine. Pulse rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, pain score. Is the patient drowsy or not? And what is the dose of injection morphine the patient received? So you can see this patient uh, came at 10 o'clock. Uh, they have recorded pulse rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure. And the pain score is 10 by 10. Patient is not drowsy. They have given injection morphine 1.5. Waited for uh, 10 minutes. Uh, at 10, 10, they are reassessing the patient. Again, recording all the vitals. Asking the patient, what's the pain score now? So patient says it is seven. We are looking at the patient and asking the patient, are you drowsy? No, you will give another 1.5. So you can continue to uh, give injection morphine 1.5 milligram. Either the patient has good pain relief or the patient becomes drowsy. So this patient at 10.50 uh, was the last dose and 11 o'clock uh, when checked, the pain score is one. That means patient has satisfactory pain relief patient is not drowsy so we will stop the trial then so this patient received total 9 milligram of injectable morphine okay uh, so 9 milligram of IV morphine gave good pain relief so how can we convert this patient to oral morphine what should be the equivalent dose This 9 milligram is the 4 hourly dose, then we can start with 10 milligram uh, 4 hourly to the patient. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, this patient uh, received 9 milligram for the first time. Okay. Uh, and um, so, uh, in such patients, we can convert the IV morphine to the same oral dose. So he received nine milligram of IV morphine. So we can convert it into nine milligram of oral morphine. That's how uh, conversion is in patients who are uh, receiving IV morphine uh, and not on any opioids. So uh, nine milligram is equal to nine milligram of oral morphine. Uh, but uh, if you uh, look at the availability of uh, morphine tablets, it is uh, 10 milligram tablets. So as Madam told, 
uh, we have to give 10 mg oral tablet. So uh, this is how you have to give oral morphine tablet. You have to give it every four hours. Uh, and um, at bedtime, we usually give double dose in order to avoid the um, 2 a.m. dose. So we will, uh, instead of waking up, uh, you can make it 6 a.m then 10 a.m., 2 p.m., 6 p.m., uh, and 10 p.m. At 10 p.m. or bedtime, uh, we need to give double dose. And in addition to this, so this is the normal dose. In addition to this, we can also ask the patient to take SOS dose when the patient has severe pain in between. Okay, so morphine should be given every four hourly for pain. And there are some situations uh, in which uh, morphine uh, is given uh, eight hourly or 12 hourly or even once daily. But usually uh, this is the uh, pattern. Any doubts uh, till now? Anybody, if you have any doubts, you can also uh, type it in the chat box. So, uh, if you uh, does, uh, if you don't have uh, injectable morphine, you can give oral morphine trial. Oral morphine trial is given uh, by um, if the patient is opioid name, that is a patient who is not on any opioid, you can start the patient directly on. 5 milligram of oral morphine every 4 hourly and SOS. But if the patient is on um, weak opioids like tramadol or tapentadol, you can directly start them on 10 milligram of morphine 4 hourly and SOS. So our patient, uh, we started after morphine trial, uh, injectable morphine trial, we started this patient on 10 milligram of morphine 4 hourly and SOS. And she was uh, okay uh, with pain relief for the last two weeks. But then uh, she started uh, needing uh, three SOS dose uh, for the last four days. What shall we do now? Do we need to do anything with uh, morphine dosage? Increase the dose. Yeah we have to increase the dose. So let's see uh, what is the indication for increasing the dose of morphine. If the patient is taking two or more than SOS dose, so we can increase the dose of opioids or morphine by 30 to 50 percentage, even uh, after uh, every 24 hours. So if the patient is taking two or more than SOS doses, you can increase the dose by 30 to 50 percentage after 24 hours. So this patient was taking 10 milligram every four hour day. So how much could you increase the dose? What would be the new dose? What should be the dose, new dose? 15 milligram totally. Yeah, 15 milligram per hour. So we can increase it to 15 milligram per hour. And you have to also give, uh, give SOS dose. The 15 milligram, whatever be the regular dose, that is the SOS dose. So this patient is taking 15 milligram per hour. And the SOS dose will be 15 milligram. But at night, we will give 30 milligram. Okay. So how frequently would you give SOS dose of oral morphine? So a patient is taking morphine at 6 a.m. 10 milligram he took at 6 a.m. A patient uh, says that uh, by 6.30 a.m. patient uh, comes to you and tell you that, doctor, I don't have pain relief. Uh, please do something. So what will you do? Anybody? Give her an Shall extra dose for the breakthrough pain. Okay. So uh, let's uh, see uh, the metabolism of morphine. Then only we will get some idea about this. 
So do you know what is this? This is poppy plant uh, or scientifically it is papa or somniferum. And it is legally grown only in three states in India, UP, MP and Rajasthan. And uh, uh, morphine is the most abundant uh, or opium. Uh, uh, morphine is the most abundant uh, alkaloid in this poppy plant. So these are poppy shields. Uh, and you can see the farmers are making small cuts in the seed-like thing. It is known as pore. And uh, the sap uh, which oozes out from the pore is collected and dried in sunlight, uh, which is then uh, transported to government opium and alkaloid factories, uh, where they will make a morphine powder from this sap. And uh, this morphine powder will be distributed to uh, various uh, pharmaceuticals, which makes morphine tablets or capsules or injection. And uh, uh, what happens uh, if you swallow morphine? It is uh, mainly absorbed from the upper small bowel. And uh, from the upper small bowel, it goes into the blood vessels. From there, it goes into the portal vein to the liver, where the metabolism takes place. And uh, the metabolites are then liberated into the systemic circulation. So the main metabolism uh, happens in liver, but minor metabolism also takes part in liver, uh, kidney, and the brain. And uh, ninety percentage of morphine is converted into metabolites, and there are uh, two main metabolites. That is M3G, that uh, morphine three glucuronide, and morphine six glucuronide. So you can see a morphine 6 glucuronide is formed only in 5 to 10 percentage. But the other one, M3G, is uh, 45 to 55 percentage. Uh, this is the paradox. Uh, the M6G is the active component which will give you pain relief, which is formed only in small quantity. Uh, M3G doesn't have much action in our body. So morphine has to be swallowed. It has to be absorbed from the upper small bowel, and then go into the liver and uh, metabolize, and then liberate to the systemic circulation. So for this process to occur, at least uh, 30 minutes um, needed uh, to get starting the pain relief. But uh, by one hour, it will reach peak. So uh, if you ask me when to give a dose of morphine, it should be given after one hour of the previous course. So we have to uh, wait for one hour uh, before giving the next dose. So our patient, uh, his pain is stabilized uh, with the 10 milligram four hourly, but he finds it difficult to take every four hourly. We know that this is a very common problem with the patient. They will uh, tell us that uh, we, uh, there are a handful of medication to take and uh, it is every four hour day. I cannot take this. So can you do something? Uh, I am willing to take it if you give it less frequently. What can you do in this situation? Sustain release tablet or control release. Yeah. It will yeah. Release. You can give sustain release or control release. Both are same. Sustain SR or CR tablet. And the duration of action of uh, sustain release tablet is 12 hours. So our patient is taking 10 milligram uh, six times. So it is 60 milligram. Six times means it is every four hours. So that's why it, it is 60 milligram. So you can give tab morphine as a 30 milligram daily. Okay. And uh, uh, you are giving sustained release morphine 30 milligram daily, but uh, sometimes patient can have breakthrough pain in between. So you have to also give the immediate release morphine uh, for breakthrough pain. So it, it would be same as the previous one, that is 10 milligram. So these are the preparations of morphine available. Active solutions, tablets, uh, as we told, there are two types, immediate release and control release and injections. Uh, the uh, strength of injection would be uh, 
variable from state to state. In Kerala, it is 15 milligram per ml. So our patient is on 10 milligram morphine for hourly for the past six months. He was brought to you with an excessive drowsiness. And on examination, you find that his serum creatinine has elevated to five milligrams per deciliter. What would you do with morphine dosage? Or do we need to alter the morphine dosage? Anybody? So uh, we need to understand the expression of morphine. So morphine is excreted by glomerular filtration. So when the renal failure occurs, the morphine and its metabolites accumulate in the body. And that's why uh, the patient becomes drowsy. In addition to drowsiness, the patient can have delirium and frequent jerky movements. So uh, uh, what we need to do is we have to increase the spacing. So instead of four hourly, you can now uh, make the dosing uh, PID or uh, 12 hourly or something like that. And also reduce the dose of morphine from 10 milligram to 5 milligram. Or you have to use an uh, renally safe opioid. So either fentanyl or methadone. So this, this two are the renally safe opioids. So now we reduce the dose of morphine to 5 milligram, 8 hourly. But uh, after two months, this patient was unable to swallow anything, including morphine. Uh, the patient is uh, actually terminal, but uh, she has pain uh, because he is unable to take morphine already. So can we help the patient in any way? Now, the patient is at home. The uh, caregiver is coming and reporting to you this problem. How can we help the patient? Patch can be suggested. Uh, patch. Which, which patch? Uh, fentanyl patch. Uh, okay. Uh, fentanyl patch. Okay. Uh, any other options? IV morphine? Uh, yeah, uh, injectable morphine uh, is good, will be good, but uh, uh, who will be direct form to administer uh, injectable morphine? Uh, that is one question. And the other question is, uh, would you provide the caregiver with the injectable morphine? That's the second question. If the patient is at home. And Dr. Vinayak, you are muted. Please unmute and speak. Liquid formulations. Uh, liquid formulation. Uh, yeah, uh, but still, I suppose, patient is unable to take that. Correctly. Okay. Per Can we give morphine correctly? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what are the routes through which we can administer morphine? So, most commonly, we know that orally, it can be given intravenously or subcutaneously. Um, then, correctly, morphine can be administered epidural and intrathecal. So what, uh, how, or uh, what should be the dose of morphine and uh, what formulation would you use to administer correctly? And, That's uh, the immediate more, release. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, immediate release morphine should be used uh, to administer morphine correctly. Actually morphine is hydrophilic. It is water soluble. So you can actually make a paste uh, with the two drops of water and uh, 
just rub it over the anal mucosa, uh, which will be absorbed. Uh, the dose is same as the dose which he was taking already, and the frequency will also be the same. So the, our patient was getting pain relief with five milligram eight hourly. So you can give uh, five milligram eight hourly through parietal route, which is equally uh, effective as oral route. And uh, some people consider this uh, it is uh, superior to oral route. Uh, we don't have uh, morphine suppositories, so you have to use immediate release morphine. Sublingual or gingival routes should not be used. It should not be used. Um, uh, as I told you earlier, it is not uh, lipophilic. And uh, um, you might have heard that uh, people administering uh, morphine sublingually or gingivity and getting pain relief. But what I have to say is uh, if uh, somebody say, uh, tell you that I got pain relief after sublingual or gingival administration, that means the patient has swallowed it. That's why the patient has pain relief. So it is not recommended to give morphine sublingually or gingivity. Um, so um, uh, we can actually give uh, five milligram per rectal eight hourly, the immediate acting or fast acting tablet, both are safe. Uh, so uh, this is what I uh, plan to cover today. Uh, and uh, if you have any doubts, uh, we can discuss it now. uh thank you very much sir, for that very lucid presentation uh it was quite useful to hear you again um so uh, i'll open the discussion towards questions uh, if you have any questions please unmute yourself and ask sir or you can uh, put it in the chat window and uh, we can take it from there so can i ask one question yes please uh, case you have taken up uh, why couldn't we have used fentanyl patches for this patient? Uh, which one? Uh, the patient who is terminal? Yes. The... Yeah. yeah, that's an option. Uh, but uh, there are two things uh, which I wanted to uh, bring into your notice. One is uh, the patient is terminal. So when you apply fentanyl patch, it will take about 8 to 12 hours uh, to act in your body. Because fentanyl uh, first makes a subcutaneous tissue depth. Uh, so it, it forms a storage in your subcutaneous tissue and then it will be liberated um, into the system in circulation. So this will take about 8 to 12 hours. So for the first 8 to 12 hours, you have to still continue with morphine. Uh, that is one thing. The second thing is uh, it is costly. Uh, if you compare to morphine, maybe 100 times more uh, costlier than morphine. So these are the two things um, which I wanted you to know, uh, uh, which I think uh, you will be knowing this, but. Uh, That's true. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Binay. Uh, uh, Dr. Sunil, uh, I, this is not uh, the drug and dosage. Yeah. Prescription, uh, yeah. documentation of the prescription. Yeah. And how long the, so actually usually pharmacy, some of us are practicing in pharmacies. I, I, I had to be a doctor for the narcotic licensing. Uh, I mean, oncologist I can be, but we didn't have a pain specialist in that time. So I, is there anything which we need to uh, be clear about? I mean, this is off the track or something like that, but I'm just asking. So is there any uh, takeaway points for that? Uh, okay. Uh, so, um... Uh, for uh, morphine uh, to be available for your institution, uh, you would need an RMI, um, RMI status, which will be awarded by the uh, state uh, drug controller uh, or equivalent authority. And once you have the RMI, RMI means recognized medical institution status. So for getting the recognized medical institution status, um, there should be a doctor uh, who has at least 10 days of experience uh, in the management of pain. Uh, so uh, with that, if you apply to the uh, drug controller, uh, they should provide the RMI uh, status. Once you get that, you can uh, stock and dispense morphine. Uh, 
and uh, if you give it to um, patients in the uh, narcotic uh, role uh, it doesn't talk about uh, how long it should be given to the patient but uh, i think it would be better uh, uh, if you uh, look at the patient means uh, if they come from a long distance we usually provide for uh, one or maximum uh, one month or uh, sometimes two months uh, to some patients uh, but it is always um, good to um, give it for uh, at least for two weeks uh, if they can come uh, frequently um, sir, we have, sir, we have two questions in the chat box. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Dr. Vinayak has one more question. Let's take sir, that. Uh, I, I was more keen on the documentation part. I, I, this, there is experience happened to me. Yeah. One of the staff has misused the prescription seal and other things. Uh, this is just off track, I'm just asking. So the documentation uh, part, the, like uh, yeah, yeah. that part, I'm very clear that what prescription you write, do you need, need to keep uh, copy for yourself for a long term? Yeah. One. Two, the prescription uh, at the pharmacy, how long should be there? I usually write them my phone number. If this uh, prescription comes more than once, you know, something like that, you have to sort clarification with me. Uh, and uh, what are the, the, how you can safeguard yourself from the, it's quite possibility happens. So that, that has been. Yes, yes. Uh, it's, a, it's a very practical thing. Um, and uh, as per NDPS rule, uh, we have to actually uh, document uh, the uh, stock and dispense, uh, how uh, are you going to dispense the morphine. So there is a record uh, which is given in the um, website or uh, even we can send it to you and uh, we can send a sample uh, how our record look like so that uh, your uh, documentation is correct and your stock and uh, your stock is tallied with uh, what is available in the register uh, so it is your responsibility uh, not uh, some uh, other people responsibility so there will be an overall in charge uh, of this uh, rmi uh, status so that doctor would be responsible so it is your responsibility to keep the documentation properly and in addition to uh, writing it in the register you also need to keep um, a, a narcotic uh, form in the uh, patient's uh, case file uh, whenever you dispense the morphine that should be signed by the uh, patient or by the caregiver so you will write the quantity you will uh, give the uh, whether it is tablet or capsule and the strength also so these are the two things which you need to make sure while you stock and dispense um, essential narcotic drugs thank you sir thank you uh, dr ashok uh, sir there were two questions in the chat box if you can uh, yeah. take yeah. them uh, yeah, dr ujjwal yeah, asking if lactulose should be used after morphine uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, actually, uh, if you look at the literature, um, it says uh, the best thing is to combine uh, two uh, laxatives, like um, a stimulant laxative plus uh, a, a softening uh, laxative, uh, maybe like uh, liquid paraffin, something like that. Uh, it is available as Tramafin. Uh, but uh, you can also combine uh, stimulant laxity with lactulose. That's also uh, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, Dr. Anand is asking uh, oral to IV morphine conversion. Yes. Uh, so, uh, when we talked about uh, intravenous morphine titration, uh, we told that uh, with what dose the patient got relief. Suppose it is 5 milligram, you can convert it into the uh, oral dose. It is 5 milligram, IV is equal to 5 milligram oral. But uh, the conversion from IV to oral is different. Uh, in the IV morphine trial, we have uh, given uh, injection only for uh, some time, maybe at the most uh, 5 or 6 doses. But if you have given intravenous morphine for one day or two days, that means 
there will be a constant blood level uh, in the uh, patient's body so when you give injection morphine continuously for more than 24 hours then the conversion would be different the conversion would be by 3 intravenous morphine suppose you are giving uh, or you have administered morphine in, intravenous morphine uh, 60 mg uh, over 24 hours last for the last two days that means uh, this patient is now receiving uh, 60 into uh, 3 that is multiplied by 3 so the patient should receive 190 milligram of oral morphine and uh, if the patient is receiving 190 milligram of oral morphine then we can convert uh, divide by 3 to get 60 milligram of IV morphine uh, the IV morphine trial which I talked was it is happening only for um, maybe uh, for some time uh, for 40 minutes or uh, at the maximum one hour so the blood level is not stabilized that's why we have converted uh, the same IV dose to oral morphine but in those who are receiving IV morphine for longer time for more than 24 hours then the conversion would be different I hope it is clear. Yes, sir. So uh, that's uh, all we have time for this time. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sunil, for joining us. And thank you to all the participants for listening keenly and uh, asking all the relevant questions. Uh, so uh, again, once again, I'm reminding you there will be a... Um, a feedback form that will be sent to you. Please, if you can, fill, fill the form and send it back uh, today itself. Uh, so uh, we'll stop the, uh, uh, the meeting here now and we will see each other on, uh, on, in Venice, on Wednesday, next Wednesday for the next uh, session. Uh, thank you, everyone. Good night. Stay safe.